Okay, welcome back to part 5 on the How Tech Elite tutorial. So, in the past few videos we looked at all the outputs of an ECU, the minimum required to control an engine, which is the injectors and the ignition coil control. But in order to know what to do with them, we need to have various inputs to help the ECU decide how to control its outputs. So, as you notice that most tables here that have a decision made by the ECU require a couple of inputs the primary being the uh, engine speed but also some sort of load and load determines how full the cylinder is or the amount of throttle given to the engine or the amount of boost given to the engine it's a way of determining the difference between light throttle and full throttle high load low load now you could in theory run an engine on just a TPS sensor and an RPM signal or just a map sensor and an RPM signal and nothing else and you could make an engine run but the problem is conditions aren't always the same. Conditions change with temperatures and pressures and all sorts of other conditions. So the more sensors we can incorporate into the system to more accurately model the amount of air that's getting into a cylinder, the better. And then the more precise our decision making can be. So from a fueling point of view, we're trying to really model the ideal gas law as close as possible. And there's a few inputs to go into that. There's pressure, volume and temperature. So volume will come from the size of the cylinder, the size of the engine, that's kind of fixed. We've then got the pressure, which comes from either barometric pressure, if you're doing, say, a throttle body car, or manifold pressure, if you're doing a uh, car with a single throttle or a boosted car, you look at manifold pressure generally. And then obviously air density can change in the ideal, ideal gas law because of temperature. Now it can change from just the intake air temperature coming into the engine but also things like coolant temperature can also affect it so just because you measure air temperature at your throttle body doesn't mean that the air doesn't heat up as it goes through the manifold and down past the valve so sometimes you use like coolant temperature as well to help model what's going on and obviously the more accurate your modeling can be the better your fueling will be so in this video we're going to look at the basic sensors required to model the inputs required for the easy to make decisions um, the other sensors you can do which are more known as feedback sensors so a lambda sensor, for example, isn't required to make an engine run, but it will feed back to you whether your decision making was correct or whether, in fact, you were slightly off in your decision making and help the engine to, or the ECU to adjust the engine's uh, control to get it back where you want. So let's say you wanted lambda 1, you looked at your air temperature, your air pressure, you looked at all the values in your map and you decided, right, we're going to squirt this much fuel in, and you're actually 2-3% lean. The lambda sensor is a feedback mechanism which then says the ECU, ah, adjust by 3% more than what you thought and you'll get close to the right answer. So the feedback sensors aren't needed to run the engine, they're just there to get more fine control. What we're going to start with is just the basic input sensors. So we're looking at air temperature sensor, coolant temperature sensor, manifold pressure sensor, throttle position sensor, things like that. So in a Haltech this is set up on the main setup option and we have the functions set up here. Now this option gives you what the ECU can do. Down the bottom here you've got all the possible functions the ECU can do. There's lots of things here. Um, if this is missing it's because this little button's pressed and you need to click inside the search field and then pin it. Uh, go through here and tick the sensors you want. For example if you want an air temperature sensor, edit connection, it'll give you all the possible wires you can use in your ECU for that sensor. Select the appropriate wire and hit OK. Um, some of them will require a pull-up resistor, like a two-wire air temperature sensor will require a pull-up resistor. Other ones such as um, what we're doing for manifold pressure here. Is it up here somewhere? Manifold pressure sensor, for example, doesn't use a pull-up resistor because the three-wire sensor has got a five volt of ground and a signal built into it. Um, so what you generally do with these sensors is you've got the type of input, where did it come from? So you've got a voltage sensor, a resistive sensor, or a thermal couple. Choose the type of sensor, and then what you need to look at is the calibration. Now, if you if you have sensors that come from the car originally, you can try and extract this data from maybe the factory ECU, from a data sheet that goes to the sensor. But truthfully, some of the easy things to do is just to buy a decent Haltech or Bosch or commonly known air temperature sensor that suits your range typically you know 130 to minus 20 or 140 to minus 40 sort of ranges are fairly typical and that will cover anything your car will ever see and with things like that you can pretty much load pre-made 
uh, calibrations here. So they've got a whole bunch of known sensors you can pick that they're aware of, like you know the GM air temperature sensor, for example, the Haltech ones, ones from various different Japanese cars that are commonly known, and that is the best way to go about it. If you don't know the sensor calibration, please don't just guess and try and fill in approximate values because you know being three or four percent off can be the difference between the air fuel ratio being right or wrong. So it's best to pick sensors that are known. Um, and if you haven't got a known sensor, for the cost of it, just buy a sensor that's appropriate. You know, there's Haltech, various ones that are universal you can get and fit. So we have an air temperature sensor. Barometric pressure is obviously useful when you've got things like a throttle body car because um, you haven't got a manifold pressure sensor, so you'd use this as your primary input for your volumetric efficiency model. So you'd use air temperature and barometric pressure, and then you'd use TPS, for example, for your thr uh, fuel map. Um, barometric pressure can also be used on a natural spray engine to do with pressure ratios, so as you actually go up a mountain where the air pressure is lower, the exhaust can breathe out easier for the same manifold pressure, so it's a useful thing to have. This, in this case we've got the onboard sensor. Um, look, let's look down at coolant temperature sensor, again very much like when you run an air temperature sensor, use a known sensor, if you haven't got one, buy one that's, that's known, don't just make a calibration up. Um, you can get a calibration from Haltech and get a Haltech sensor or a variously known car or from a data sheet from that sensor. Going down to manifold pressure sensor, for example, again you can use the onboard sensor here, but this will this will clash with how we use its barometric. So you could run a vacuum line from your manifold straight down to your ECU and use the onboard sensor. Or in this case we've got a sensor that is um, wired into a pin and you can see here we've got two points of reference of voltage and two different pressures and that goes all the way up so we've got a, a good range there uh, and the last one to look at here is the throttle position sensor now this one is a variable resistor it's a three wire sensor normally so again no pull up resistor you have your five volts you ground in the signal wire and as the throttle moves it moves on a trace which changes the resistance and therefore changes the output this one you tend not to have a pre-known calibration for here, but if you've got one, great. But the easiest thing to do is use the wizard where you hit start, and with these actually plugged in online, you'd be able to say, this is 0% throttle, push the pedal to the ground, press the next button, and then release. And that means the ECU can then work out exactly where the throttle is based on the voltage output from the sensor. Um, other basic inputs you might want to look at, something like uh, maybe speed sensors, so in this case we've got a speed sensor from the uh, I believe the gearbox in this car and this is not a voltage signal, this is a pulsed signal and it uses either a Hall effect or a Lucta type sensor just like a crank or a cam sensor would. It may or may not require a pull-up sensor and it may be on the falling or rising edge, you'd have to break your oscilloscope out to work out the most accurate sensor uh, input for that. And to calibrate that you literally roll the car at a known speed, so on the dyno we hold it at 60 miles an hour or 100 kph and we hit calibrate and then the ECU knows how many pulses are happening at that speed. So those are your basic inputs. Uh, if you want to look more into the feedback options, so you want to know what's actually going on with the car, you might choose to include an O2 sensor. So Haltech here has option for several wide bands. You could either use it as a canvas module, or again you can get a separate module like an old AEM or an Innovate module and you can wire it to a pin, at which point you'd then be able to say it's connected to this pin, for example, and then you get calibration saying, well, at 0 volts and 5 volts, this is what the lambda is, or the AFR is. Um, but for most people, they tend to use the Haltech canvas modules, and what you do is you enable the devices here. So we can say we can either use the auxiliary CAN one, which is the plug next to the USB port, now if you're going to use this one, you need to put your EC in a waterproof place because it means the waterproof cover must be removed. Or you can wire your own cam wires into the main plugs, which can be waterproofed. Um, so you've got one for your vehicle can, which is like your OBD port, and one for your Haltech can. So in this case we've wired it into the main connector so we can seal the ECU and we're not actually using the uh, vehicle can for our one anyway. And then what you can do is you can say, well I've got a IQ dash and you want to outputs the dash, whether you've got an IO expander box, whether you've got thermocouples, in this case we've got six thermocouples because we're running individual thermocouples on this ECU, but what I was looking for here, we've got a wideband controller, 
Now, because this box comes with a canvas, you just put your sensor into the box, plug your box into your canvas, and it's done. And then you assign it to wideband one here, which is your wideband one box. Um, another feedback type sensor you can use is a knock detection sensor. So in this case we've got two knock sensors, one for the left three cylinders, one for the right three cylinders, and this can then be used to feedback to the ECU where the knock occurred. So it helps you tune your ignition timing, which then gets later into knock control and so on. Um, trying to think of other sensors here. So other inputs you don't need to run an engine, but could be good for feedback and safety, for example. An oil temperature sensor. That's very good for saying, is the engine getting too hot? Maybe put up a warning light or limit the engine revs or cut boost if the engine gets too hot. Oil pressure sensor, for example. If the oil pressure starts to drop below what's expected, you can enable the safety to just cut the engine. Um, what other sort of sensor inputs do we got here? Uh, we've got a fuel temperature sensor here. So again, we can monitor fuel temperature, which helps us to find control the injectors and also fuel pressure so fuel pressure isn't on target. Uh, remembering that in the earlier videos we talked about setting fuel pressure up inside the ECU here as a base number um, at 3 bar. Well what happens if your fuel pump's working too hard and it can't quite maintain pressure well, you're only just going to lean out. By enabling a fuel pressure sensor we can actually control the fueling to account for the fact that fuel pressure has dropped, squirt the injector for longer and keep the engine safe and if it drops too much we can then just cut the um, engine, uh, you know, have a rev limiter or set the engine off or something. Um, and then finally other sort of feedbacks here, we've got the six exhaust gas temperature sensors per cylinder which is basically plugged into the different cam modules as you can see each sensor is on a different module, different plug number on that module. And that way we can feed back to ourselves while tuning what the exhaust gas temperatures are doing and actually help to balance our cylinders individually, see if there's a problem, or see if we're running too lean, because an AFR is a good starting point if your exhaust gas temperatures are really, really, really low, then you might better lean it out and actually save some fuel. Or if they're getting high, you might have to, you know, put some more fuel in to keep it safe. So these are feedback sensors again. Um, whether the engine ECU just does it for a monitoring purpose or whether it actually uses it to correct itself is down to how you map the ECU. Um, I think that's all we need to cover on just inputs and stuff, setting up the inputs. But basically. The minimum I'd say for anyone is to is an air temp sensor, some sort of pressure sensor, whether it's barometric or map, depends on whether you're doing throttle bodies or manifold. Um, a coolant temperature sensor and a throttle position sensor is an absolute minimum to make an engine run reliably. I'd recommend, if possible, to use a wideband and a knock sensor to keep feedback to the ECU as a minimum. And if you've got the budget to stretch out, start looking at things like oil pressure and fuel pressure, oil temperature and so on as extra sensors to help you find control your ECU and actually add some protection. Alright, thanks for watching.